And that's the key here. We need these archetypes because they inspire us and they empower us. That is a natural condition of the human psyche. So guys love to go to the movie theater and see the action thriller movies, and they love to see the superheroes, these glorious archetypes upon the film with whom they can identify for a brief period, for two hours in the dark. It's a sacred ritual. The same goes for these goddess archetypes. We want to be able to identify with them as well for a few hours in the dark. That's a sacred ritual, but we don't see as many of them on the screen, and what we tend to get on the screen is predominantly sexualized objects in Western culture, very different from the paragraph that we just read for Rolling Stone. So we need goddesses of wisdom and truth and justice and creativity and music and art and song and counsel and birth and death and motherhood and childhood and all these various archetypes to empower us. So for example, if we go back to Greco-Roman mythology, who are the goddesses? They are Athena's the goddess of wisdom, Artemis is also known as Diana, the goddess of the hunt. She participates in archery, she focuses on a target, and she hits it. This symbolizes focusing on a goal and achieving it. This can help to inspire us as women as, and as men, because we have a female anima within, and all women also have a male animus within. So, Gods can inspire women to action, and goddesses can inspire men to action. And they do, right? So we women are inspired by a superhero, and men can just as easily be inspired by a superhero win. So in addition, we have Demeter, who is the mother archetype. Maybe that would inspire the mothers in here in the classroom. Something to emulate, something that represents our own psyche. So what is it? Do, do these goddesses exist? Do these gods exist? None of us really know. But these are, these are examples of the mystery. And the archetypes exist because they represent or they reflect aspects of our own psyches. They represent behavioral patterns in the human being. It's not that Artemis necessarily exists any out, anywhere out there. Actually, she exists in here. On some level, I have these feelings of ambition and, and desire to achieve and evolve, and she represents that for me. So I take all those urges and all those drives and I affect them onto this image, this archetype of Artemis, and she comes to represent that for me. So when you destroy her, when you erase her, from the globe, you are ripping her from my consciousness. And I want her back. I want to emulate her. I want to follow her. And she can also help me to understand myself. Because sometimes I might want to be in a relationship, and sometimes I don't. And Artemis is a virgin goddess. She is known to be lesbian. She associates with women. She doesn't get bogged down in relationships with men. She stays focused on her goal. Then we have the archetype of Hera. Hera is the goddess of marriage. So, and then at another stage in my life, I might be interested in relationship, loyalty, commitment, and marriage. And I would like to marry someone who looks like Zeus. <laughs> so these archetypes are playful ways of understanding our own psyche. And on some level, uh, they're important to all of us. And when I began to read about goddess mythology, it started to resonate with me. And I started to realize what they have taken from me. And I was angry. So I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I would go <laughs> on Sunday and uh, sit in the pews, as we call them. It's an interesting word, the pews. And I would hear about the Holy Trinity. Lovely word, Trinity, three, I like the number three. And the Trinity was composed of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and a ghost. And I thought, I used to sit there and wonder, as a little girl, where's the mother and the daughter? She's been ghosted. They have ghosted her. And how strange, because actually the father, the son, and the daughter, and the mother all come from the mother. But she's nowhere to be found. Oh, there's a Virgin Mary, right, I forgot. But she's a virgin. And, of course, most women in their lifetime are not going to be virgins. They're going to have relationships and husbands and children. And so, therefore, the Virgin Mary is something that they can never be. So why hold up an ideal to me that I cannot really, truly, and realistically aspire to? That's also debilitating. Nonetheless, I love Mary, I love the archetype, and I loved her as a child. And it comforts me and soothes me, but I need more. So we get more from all these marvelous women theorists who are telling us about what happened to the goddess, who she is, where she was. And to give you a little bit of historical background now, we're going to look at the board, turn to the board, board for a moment, and we learn that uh, scholars such as Adrian Rich tell us in A Woman Born, Leanne Eisler tells us in The Chalice and the Blade, Merlin Stone tells us in When God Was a Woman, Maria Gambutis tells us in her work, she was a professor at UCLA, and so forth. We have these great women scholars who are excavating, doing archaeological digs in some cases, studying the artifacts and determining that for 20,000 years prior to the advent of patriarchy, the, all of humanity worshipped a goddess. We worshipped a goddess for 20,000 years. And my question is, what the heaven happened to her? And why is it that wherever I go today, I hear only a single male god invoked and dominating us over us all. So whether it's in Judaism or Christianity or Islam, there apparently is only one male god dominating over everyone. That's, to my mind, unrepresentational of humanity. So this is what we had in ancient times. According to scholars now, as a result of new technologies, carbon dating, and so forth, and the studying of these artifacts that are excavated, these the beautiful statuary, the sculptures, the writings on the cave walls, and so forth, most of it depicts a female deity. This is also stated in the Encyclopedia Britannica, a very venerable reference that has been around for many years, 1997, under the heading Ancient European Religions, they write the following. And this is on page nine in your text. For roughly 20,000 years, as you can see on the board from 23,000 to 3,000 BCE, the, from the upper Paleolithic period to the beginning of the Bronze Age, the continent of Europe was home to a matrifocal, meaning mother-focused, matrifocal, pre-agrarian culture, sedentary and peaceful. By the third millennium BCE, that's 3000 before the Common Era, 3000 BCE, Indo-European invaders from the steppe region north of the Black Sea had imposed their language and their patriarchal, violent culture across the continent. So the patriarchal, violent culture begins to wipe out the matriarchal, peaceful culture. This patriarchal violent culture also is God worshiping and the matriarchal cultures are goddess worshiping and they actually worship a multiplicity of goddesses and gods. They're also egalitarian. They even worship animal deities. They're very egalitarian. So, according to archeological evidence, the old Europeans worshiped a goddess. There is no consensus of interpretation among scholars regarding the iconography of the goddess Yet her absolute predominance over male representations is unmistakable. Pretty interesting stuff. 